everybody, and welcome back to The Art Corner. I am your co-host, Vicky Tai. And I'm Anusha Sayed. And today we have our very first interviewee on our show with us, Sid Weiler, is that correct? Did I pronounce right. that? Yeah, good job. All right, Yay. awesome. Sid Weiler. Welcome, Sid. Thank you so much thank for joining you. us yeah, on our thank show. Thank you so much. Thanks. Congrats on being the first. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. That's a big honor. I'm really excited. <laughs> We are very excited to have you on today, and we have just, we've got so many things to ask you about. <laughs> yeah, I'm coming in blind. I have no idea about any of this, so this is going to be interesting for me, at least. Oh, we have no idea what we're doing. <laughs> Great. No, no okay. worries. All we're on the, the same blind page. leading the blind. Yeah, yeah. But um, let's start off with something, you know, that's very, very easy to answer. Can we just ask you, what do you do and who are you? Can you just give okay. us a brief introduction? Yes. Yeah. Um, my name is Sid Weiler. I'm an illustrator, animator. I usually combine those two things into illustrator animator, so feel free. <laughs> um, I love it. <laughs> I'm a creative streamer. I'm partnered on Twitch, so I uh, have been building up a stream community there for about two years now. have been on a little bit of a hiatus recently, um, and I make Photoshop brushes. So I currently... Um, run a Patreon page where I kind of release them, I guess, like subscription box style. I try to do every Monday, Wednesday, Friday for various uh, patrons, but I'm building up a huge Photoshop brush library. My brushes are pretty unique. They do just like foliage or clouds. Um, they're, they're all custom and they're built to make my own workflow very quick. Uh, so I kind of release those as I go for people who want to support my work and play around with them. Um, I was an Adobe Creative Resident last year in the year of 2016 to 2017, so that was like a year-long gig where they kind of, it's kind of like a sponsorship, they kind of uh, picked my work out and gave me a lot of time and money to, to make that, which was fantastic. Um, and now I am a freelance illustrator, I guess, working with an agent with clients on a day-to-day -day basis, and... Yeah, did I get everything? <laughs> yeah, that was a pretty great sum up. Uh, that was oh. beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot uh, what most people would, if they didn't know me, know me from. Um, I created a thing called Trash Doves. Uh, yes. Kind of <laughs> internet yeah. Like once, and um, yeah, it's been terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Trash <laughs> are a sticker set that I created for iOS about a year ago exa exactly, and uh, Facebook licensed in December of last year, went up on the site, so you can use them like in Messenger and chatting and stuff as like hyped up emojis. And um, it's basically just like a small purple bird, the most famous one, like head bangs. I can't <laughs> tell you why. And uh, yeah, the internet liked them for a little while. So that's been my life for most of this year. It's uh, it's well, actually amazing I... like how big it just like <laughs> blew up. Uh, did you expect that? Yeah, it was literally overnight. <laughs> I I've seen those those little purple dudes, and I think that they are adorable. Thank I you. Mean, yeah, they're just like what's not to love, basically. You know? <laughs> yeah, I'm glad so many people like them. I'm just like, oh my god, I wish anybody else but me had created them at this point. Like, <laughs> yeah, you I'm mentioned that. You mentioned that it's terrible. Can you uh, yeah. elaborate on that? Like, what's been your experience with this whole sensation? Uh, it's honestly, where do I start? Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, I haven't been too, too candid with a lot of it online. Um, I'm getting to the point where I think it's safe enough to kind of talk about my experiences and just be like, okay, this is what happened to me. Like, this is what the internet is capable of doing to like an individual creator, basically. Um, mm -hmm. It started out in Thailand. It, be, it was a meme there. They they kind of took it and made it huge, and then it spread to other places in the internet. Um, basically, what it looked like for me was like literally a Wednesday morning. I woke up and my phone was <laughs> blowing up That's from insane. all of these like people and messages. And like at that point, I didn't have anything locked down. Like most of my stuff was pretty public, even my like personal page. Um, so like all these just random like Thai people were messaging me. Um, and just kept going and going. And I saw these videos where people were, like, dancing along with them. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, like, all of these, like, edited memes that people had made. And, yeah, it just went from there. It just got bigger and bigger. And all of these news outlets wanted to do interviews. Um, my Facebook pages went from, like, 
less than a thousand likes on my personal page and like the trash stuff's page didn't even exist to like over a hundred thousand likes combined wow. in wow. four days, something like that. Um, so in the midst of all of that, some really, really bad stuff happened. Like once it left Thailand and Japan um, and came over to like English speaking primarily countries, um, it uh, 4chan got a hold of it. <laughs> So, oh my God. Um, oh no. <laughs> yeah, I actually spent most of February, March, and April fighting 4chan and pretty much the worst part of 4chan, like the part that it, not to get political here, but like um, the people that are now marching and, you know, have claimed Pepe the Frog as their mascot, like right, right. literal neo Nazis. Um, they tried to kind of co opt my bird. That's and awful. in the process, yeah, they came after me. They wanted to label me a white supremacist. I saw forums oh after forums of pages of discussion about how to do this and how to like ruin me as an artist and a person. Um, I was doxxed, like they came after my family. It was insane. It was completely insane. So um, on top of all of that, I was experiencing like mass infringement. Like mm -hmm. I learned during that period how to file a DMCA claim, which is like a copyright claim, which is how you take down work, you know, when it's being used without your permission that you own the copyright to. Um, some very, very good friends helped me with all of that kind of stuff. Uh, but basically, uh, I, I just sat and I was just, I was doing this for hours per day. Um, one night I filed 800 claims on Amazon wow. t-shirts that people Holy had put crap. bird on and were trying to just sell. Um, my friends, I was so lucky that I had these people behind me, but like a couple of my friends um, combined a Google Doc and it was just URLs listed. And uh, the, the, the Google Doc itself was like 70 pages of just URLs at one point. And... It was just all of this at once. Um, I spent my birthday filing DMCA claims, and in a 20-minute period, I found out that both Tic Tac, like the breath mitts band, mm -hmm. like the yeah, yeah. brand, and uh, David Duke, the leader of the KKK, oh had both God. like ripped my art and had posted it online without my permission. So it was it was. It was a bad couple of months, guys. Oh, that is absolutely <laughs> um, terrible. Yeah, so so it's like at this point, I have this character that a lot of people like, and like, you know, there was just as much good as there was bad. Um, I'd say there have been thousands of paintings made and pieces of art made and cosplays and just fun stuff that really, really, like, just warm my heart. You know, it's really cool to see that. Mm -hmm. um, but. Overall, it was just, it was a traumatic experience. It went from zero to like 1,000 miles per hour in the period of a week. And I tried to cater to it for a little while. Like I tried to keep up the presence of the character and like make more content. And then I just kind of hit a wall where I was like, I actually really don't want to do this. Yeah, this is too much uh, for one person. <laughs> Yeah, Absolutely. it was dealing with the fan base. It's that thing where the internet likes to take your work or the work or like, the internet likes to take the thing that they love and like make it destroy theirs. Destroy it, basically. Mm. Yeah. So that happened to me, and I was just like, people are arguing with me because they don't want to pay a dollar for my stickers. Like they just want all this stuff for free. It's just never ending, and I just kind of stopped. Like, and I've been much better since since making that decision. Honestly, that's good mm -hmm. for you. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's that's been my last couple of months since February, basically. In the midst of all of that, I moved. Um, yeah, like parted ways with Adobe because my sponsorship was for a year. Uh, it's it's been insane. <laughs> wow, that was like that must have been like a transformative experience for you. I mean, like, yeah, because like there's so many different things involved in this entire thing that you went through, and all of it is entirely unprecedented because when you made these characters. By no means did you expect any of yeah. these like offshoot yeah. things to, to happen to you. Yeah, I don't think it's necessarily unprecedented. Um, I think mm. I can name a couple other artists that it's happened to, not necessarily exactly as it happened to me. Um, but I mean, I, I I'd point to, of course, Matt Fury, the creator of Pepe the Frog. His mm -hmm. situation was a little bit different than mine in that it was happening with a, a very old character 
Um, he wasn't made aware of it until it was basically too late. Uh, Casey Green, of course, was like, this is fine. Um, that's everywhere and out of control. And mm-hmm. there are definitely some other instances. Um, but I think that the speed of which the trash dumps kind of took off and how big they got, the span of time, I think, was the first time that that's happened. And it's it's scary to me because it's definitely not the last time it's going to happen. And it's just going to keep happening. And I learned a lot, for sure. I learned a lot about myself, of course. I learned a lot about protecting myself. I learned a lot about protecting my art. I learned exactly how much copyright law does not protect us. Um, yeah, it was... It yeah. was it was a lot, that's for sure. <laughs> I know absolutely nothing about copyright law. Is there any advice that you can give to artists who are clueless about that kind of stuff? Oh, gosh. Um, well, I'm not a lawyer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> Basically, you own the copyright to, like, anything original that you create, um, barring, you know, fan art, barring offshoots of other IP uh, that you don't own copyright to. Um, Mm -hmm. Anything original that you create, you own, effectively. Um, So those rights can, of course, be assigned to clients. They can be assigned to companies. uh, You can license, you know, whatever. All of that is negotiable. Um, Where it gets tricky is when it does actually come to enforce your copyright. Um, there are few options, honestly. Uh, and I can't even imagine like being around before the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which came out in like 2000, like early 2000s, I think. But um, basically that allows you to file notice when your copyright is being infringed. You can have your, that whatever it is taken down from whatever use it's being used for. Um, a lot of people, you know, automatically jump into the mindset or like rally behind an artist who's been ripped off. And like, you'll see a lot of stuff where it's like, you should sue, like you should get money from this thing or whatever. And it's like so much more complicated than that. Um, <laughs> you can take down, you know, whatever you want, whenever it's being used for something that you don't want it to be used for. However, there is something like, and this is where I'm not a lawyer, so like disclaimer, any of this is, I don't know, subject to whatever legalese is insane. Right, that right. Lawyers make a lot of money from knowing. Um, yes. Like you have like a, a limit on how long your copyright is automatically registered. And I I want to say that that's like a couple months. That's what? something you that's have to look at. Um, that's it. And then after that, you have to actually go and register copyrights with the government you have to pay the money to put it in the system of course um and then only if you've done that and someone only if you register your copyright and someone rips your work or takes it and puts it on a t-shirt or whatever uh can you actually take it to court and like potentially get money only um in the case of a registered copyright can you actually you know escalate that to like getting you know compensation for that use of the work otherwise like pretty much all you can do is is take stuff down and um it's it's not useful for people like us uh it's not like there's you know copyright police going around on the internet like Mm -hmm. looking out for you right right (laughs) um enforcing your copyright falls to you and whomever you decide to sign over you know like the ability to do that, like your lawyer or whatever. Um, and it's just money after that. It's just paying people. And it's crazy to me that that's the only thing that's in place uh, to protect you or your work from people who would just pull it off of Google and put it on a pillow to try to sell, you know, just people who are trying to rip off of you. Um, there's really just not a lot. And I know so many people that deal with this kind of thing every single day. Uh, they take hours out Career. They take hours out of their days that they could otherwise spend, you know, working, creating, making new stuff to further their career, um, just protecting the work that they've made from, you know, knockoffs and rip-offs and 
a lot of them have gone to court. I know several people in very big lawsuits currently against huge brands that you'd recognize. It's mm-hmm. it's a huge mess, and it only benefits the lawyers. <laughs> Absolutely. So okay. at this point, so do you think there's anything that we can do to... Yeah. Recommendations for protecting your copyright is organized publication. Um, so what that means is literally just keeping a portfolio, keeping a site where you have all of your work published, visible with your name on it, um, with things like dates traceable. So this could, this literally can mean a Behance page where it's like you're publishing projects and that has a timestamp on it. It says what day, what time you published that work. Um, so that in the future, you know, if you're filing these these claims, if you need this work to be taken down anywhere else, you can literally just link those posts and say, I published this on this date. It's mine. Um, you know, like just having that kind of organized stuff in place is really the only thing you can do, honestly, that I that I can think of. Um, and that's just good for you, like as a professional anyway. You know, that's just all around. Good. Certainly. Not just for copyright. But honestly, just having organized uh, publications um, on the internet is is a good place to start. And like before the internet, what artists would do for this kind of thing, you know, before you could hit publish on a Behance post or a Tumblr post or whatever, they would literally print out their work or make a copy of it or whatever it was. Um, they put it in like a mailer, and they would mail it to themselves so that <laughs> that's really post- smart. Out- the post office would put a t- uh, the post date on it or whatever the postmark date. Um, mm-hmm. they, it would they would get it back. They would keep it sealed, like they wouldn't you know open it or anything. Um, and they'd file it away in a filing cabinet. So if the chance came that you know anything was being copied or stolen or whatever, they could pull it out and they say you know this is my work. Like this is the date that it was officially published. Here's the date from the post office, and that had to be respected. So like. It's basically just the modern version of that, like keeping keeping stuff organized online where it's visible and uh, mostly just for, for those cases. Yeah, definitely. So it's very largely dependent on the individual in order to keep track of all of these things. Entirely dependent on the individual. <laughs> Unless you happen to have a lot of money and you want to pay a lawyer a lot of money, um, it is 100% on you, which is crazy, but true. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I really hope things start to change soon and we get more rights as an artist because uh, this is exhausting. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, and I've had a lot of uh, discussions with other people who have gone through similar things with this. Um, and a lot of them were pretty optimistic a couple years ago when Creative Commons started popping out. And I don't know a whole lot about that kind of stuff. Uh, basically, you know, listing attributions with various uh, icons that, you know, told people what was available for use, what wasn't available for use, you know, what was good for use with attribution, whatever. Um, but then that all just kind of fell off. Like, it, I think whatever campaigns they were running to educate people about uh, what those little symbols meant, like what it all was involved, um, I think that just kind of hit a wall and then everyone forgot about it. Um, it I think it made a lot of sense, but I, I can see, I guess, why it it didn't go any farther. It's, it's the thing where it's like, there are no copyright police. Um, Mm -hmm. no one actually, you know, monitoring or of course there would, it would be impossible to do so, but just that fact that there's no other system in place, uh, not helping any of us. That's for sure. (laughs) It seems that like to, to be an artist now, like in the digital age, you also have to learn all of this legal stuff and to be, responsible for yourself aside yeah. from just being an artist and making things and i don't know yeah, about you exactly. but i never learned any of this in art school oh no I <laughs> no i did not learn any of it whatsoever um and i graduated two years ago like i think we're all pretty much the same age so oh, yeah it, it's yeah it's not taught in schools um it yeah it's scary <laughs> I had to learn all of this stuff from other people who had learned it from other people because, you know, they were going through something horrible and other people had reached out to them to say, like, hey, here's what you need to do. Like, that's what happened to me. That's what hap- That's what I do. Like, if I see someone else, you know, now who needs help with this kind of stuff, like, I'll message them and be like, hey, like, let me know if you need help. Like, I can walk you through how to file your first DMCA. Like, it's it's a chain of, like, education through 
exploitation, yeah. basically. They, you know, one person after another getting completely screwed, and then the people who have gotten screwed before them just trying to help, basically. That's, in my experience, what happens. Well, that's definitely one positive thing that's come out of this entire mess, is that people are now able to, like, help each other and help other artists right, there's more awareness through these, these stuff. Yeah, very through these troubles. point of light and an otherwise very dark void, but yeah, it does exist. <laughs> yeah, so hearing about that, yeah. Sorry, go on. I was going to say, a lot of it I feel is because, because the system is so complex and works so hard against you, I've come up against, a, like, I haven't even talked about, like, the ethical and moral um, kind of stuff that I've come up against, um, that's really, really complicated. And it's something that isn't discussed nearly often enough online, particularly in, in regards to fan art and the creation of fan art. Um, that's all such a, it's considered a gray area, but it's really not even a gray area. Um, it's, it's so complicated and I, I worry about so much of it. Like I think Disney is probably the best uh, example of this. Um, you know, of course it falls to the copyright holder to enforce their copyrights. Um, when the copyright is owned by a brand such as, you know, Disney or whatever, um, they either choose to enforce their copyright and say, you know, no fan art for profit is allowed. Like we're going to walk through this convention and hand out cease and desist letters, you know, mm -hmm. or it could be someone like Blizzard who like obviously takes an incredibly lax perspective on it. They actually encourage it because they see it as marketing. They see it as like community building. Like they see it as a positive, uh, you know, thing that happens with their IP. Um, like when it falls to an individual, uh, with someone who, you know, holds the copyright to something that's so big, for example, me and Trash Doves. Mm -hmm. Like, I had to take a very hard stance on, like, no fan art for sale. Um, you can't, you know, make prints. You can't sell sculptures. Right. You can't because they're profiting off of your work. Plushies. Exactly. And, like, as much as I wanted to say, yes, like, this is cool and great, and I'm glad you like it that much, like, I had to say no just because there were other cases where people were just slapping my art on a t-shirt. They were just, you know, uh, putting it on shot glasses or making bumper stickers, like all this stuff. And there's no, uh, like, difference legally. Like, I don't think that anyone sees much difference legally in that. Um, and I just couldn't, I couldn't, like, go through and do a case-by-case -case kind of thing. So now I have a lot of, like, obviously I make fan art. Like, I love making fan art. I have a lot of just like worries about like potentially selling my fan art or like am I a hypocrite for doing that mm. it's, yeah it's very it's, complicated I like wrangle with that mentally and it's, it's tough <laughs> but I don't think that that's a discussion that happens nearly enough online um just in terms of awareness like I love fan art I buy fan art like I bought some of my own fan art I have a whole like shelf of plushies <laughs> That I was like, no, you can't do that. Actually, you know, hey, mm, here's mm -hmm. you know, mail that to me, you know. Um, but like, I just don't think that there's nearly enough uh, mindfulness regarding it, and like, what can actually happen to artists if anyone happens to turn, or you know, any company that decides to take a different stance against it. It's it's such a mess, and I feel like it's a time bomb. Honestly, it's ugly. Yeah, I think you bring up a really good point, and it's interesting because with our first episode, we had talked about sort of like the, the practice of fan art more of like, you know, is it good or is it bad for the artist as an individual? But we but didn't touch on of, like um, selling it per se and like yeah, the ethical yeah. standpoint. There's two different, two different conversations, absolutely. Exactly. Um, it seems like there's a lot of guesswork that goes into, you yeah. know, whether selling it is okay yeah. or not. Exactly. Um, that's where it's like, Legally, no, it's not allowed. Um, mm -hmm. And you own license to the IP that you don't own the original copyright to, like you aren't technically legally allowed to profit off of it. But of course. like I said, it comes down to the company or the individual, whoever owns that copyright and how they choose to enforce it. And that's, yeah, that's where it's like playing roulette where it's like, well, it's okay now. And it's like, it was okay <laughs> for Disney in the past, 
but then it's like it it's just however the company structure changes like whatever you know scenario happens it forces them to like change their mind about things that it's just it, it keeps me up at night yeah, a lot yeah you have to be really <laughs> careful about that kind of stuff yeah, yeah. and i yeah. love fan art fan art is amazing and like uh yeah, it's it's such a great thing to do and, like, be able to find, you know, other people who like the things that you like. Yes, um, yes. It's so good for community building and uh, even just from a perspective of, like, online exposure. You know, it's very shareable. It's very relatable. Um, so that's really good for you just in terms of that kind of stuff. Um, but, yeah, just, <laughs> I don't know. It's It's the the profiting gets into whole this whole other discussion um, yeah honestly and anusha i'm thinking that we should have had sid on for the first yeah time i know right for like the seventh time i'm not a lawyer this is just my experience <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here folks mm-hmm. so we've we've talked a lot about your experience with trash doves and all the stuff that you have to deal with legally uh-huh. So I want to transition now into your your personal work having to do with your brushes that you create, right? And that you share with the community that you've built up around your artwork. And obviously, you are very well known for your brushes because they're beautiful and you create so many wonderful textures in your, your artwork. Thank and you. <laughs> yeah, and at the same time, I was very curious, particularly about how did you become so comfortable with sharing your process, whether it's through Twitch or with your Photoshop brushes, you know, yeah. you, you seem to have this, um, this propensity toward really sharing different processes and pieces of your artwork. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah. So like probably about two years ago, um, I, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but I failed out of art school. I failed out of my first major. Um, I was in animation at Ringling and they were like, nope, you're not going to keep going. So I was like, okay, bye. And I went over to illustration. Um, so that was a bad time in my life. Uh, <laughs> during that time, uh, my boyfriend moved, he had graduated, he moved to New York for a little while. So I was basically just kind of living alone, um, ostracized. Uh, I didn't know many people in my new, um, my new major, uh, I didn't really talk to a lot of people in my old major, and I was just, you know, feeling very alone. And I was trying to figure out what kind of work I wanted to make, um, what I wanted to keep going with, basically, because I was kind of starting over. Um, this is like three years into my college college uh, career. And I kind of stumbled upon Twitch one day because I was obsessed with Splatoon. Um, <laughs> nice. Yes. I was completely addicted. Like, I could not stop playing to the point where, I, like, I was not getting my work done. Um, and so I was like, okay, I have to fix this. Like, what if I could watch other people play Splatoon maybe while I work? I don't know, even if it's just YouTube videos. So I found Twitch that way. Um, watched that for a little while. Eventually just got bored, but it it... it kind of introduced me to this this whole world of you know people interacting online live which was I had never come across that before um and I discovered Twitch Creative that way I found other people painting you know just however they were doing digital like I was doing they were doing like you know traditional stuff watercolors you could watch people oil paint you could hang out with them and talk to them um and like I was just amazed that this whole community existed and that it was like basically flying under the radar like at that point nobody really knew about it um so it got to the point where like I loved all these communities that I would come and become a part of um but none of them were really like 100% what I was looking for in terms of content um so I was like what if I just maybe start streaming um at that point I was terrified of sharing process. Uh, <laughs> when I when I failed out, I was basically told that I would not ever be successful in a creative career. Um, mm. I had no self esteem whatsoever. I was only just starting to recover from that um, in terms of like making art that people were responding to online and in classes and whatever. Um, I didn't expect anyone to come. One, and I didn't expect to get a whole lot done, too. Uh, but I was like, maybe my mom will hang out with me. <laughs> that me. 
uh, wow, I was just making all this work, like sitting from dawn to dusk at my at my desk. Um, so I streamed and like 20 people came and I was amazed. Like I got to talk to people who I had otherwise just seen in Twitter notifications or whatever. And this was like, I, I mean, I had very, very small following at that point. It's definitely grown since then. Um, so I started doing a little bit more. I started getting more work done on stream. People started asking me questions that I had not considered myself while I was working. They'd ask, you know, like, why did you do this with your layer? Like, what's that tool that you just use? Like those kinds of things. And I was like, that was, that was like when I realized that I actually had an expertise to share. Like I developed these workflows. I discovered these things that work for me. I was able to explain them to others and show them like how I use them. And then they were able to incorporate them into their own, you know, workflows or whatever. Um, and that was a really good feeling. I, I discovered that I really liked to teach in that way. Um, so I just kept going with it. I kept building, um, I developed, like I, I developed a community, like a lot of people started becoming very regular. Um, I started sticking to a schedule after Adobe picked me up, uh, cause I was able to basically, um, sorry, I just bumped my mic. If there was a noise. Okay, no, you're fine. <laughs> Power of editing. I will cut it out. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, I just kept going with it and it, you know, I developed a whole ecosystem on my channel. Um, I completely, like before I started streaming, I didn't even, I don't even know why I started streaming. Cause I was so uncomfortable. I wouldn't even let people look over my shoulder, like while I was sketching, like they'd come up to my computer and I'd like hide it with my arms, you know, like, no, it's not, done. It's not ready. Like you can't see it. So I don't even know how I became comfortable enough to, to, you know, open up a barely started document and just be like, okay, yeah, like. You can watch me fail until it looks like something decent, I guess. That's cool. Mm -hmm. I'm comfortable with that. I have no idea how I got from A to B, but I did. And it's been very, very, very good for productivity, for my self-esteem, um, just all that good stuff. So I kind of stumbled upon brush making accidentally. I'm not a very patient person. Um <laughs> I like a lot of detail in my work, but I don't like actually spending the time to put the detail in my work. So I was working on a little series that I was doing last year called Cardens, and they're basically just cars with like a bunch of plants and stuff growing out of them. Oh, yeah, um, I've seen those. Yeah. 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 So I was drawing this car and I was like, oh my God, I don't want to draw all these little tiny leaves, but they're going to look <laughs> good when I finally do. I was like, okay. And I was on stream when I was doing this. I was like, I'm going to experiment right now. We're going to see if this works. And I made my first like minor foliage brush. So it basically just drew the leaves for me. Mm -hmm. Oh man, like I've discovered something magical. <laughs> <laughs> I just kept going with it and I kept making more and more. Uh, people wanted them, but I, I'm, this is still a concern. I was concerned um, with selling them. And this was before I knew a lot about, about copyright. So I'm really glad I didn't just kind of start selling them like on Gumroad or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I was concerned that people were going to start using them for commercial work or work on, you know, whatever, for whatever company they did. Um, because basically my brushes are a combination of a tool and my design, um, at their base. That's what they are. They're my, my interpretations of foliage of clouds. I build these tools from my original drawings. Um, and if people were going to start doing this, um, or using them for those purposes, like basically that was design work that I wasn't going to get paid for. Um, so I didn't really see that that was going to be productive for the longevity of my design career, basically. Um, so I held off on releasing them for a very long time. Um, it wasn't until probably it was after trash doves took off, um, that a lot of people found my work and then I was sharing the, the brushes like I normally did. And people were really, really kind of harassing me to, to get them out there so that they could use them, um, that I thought of Patreon. And I kind of realized that that might be a pretty good fit. I um, got a page together and I, I set up a, a release schedule so that people would get kind of random ones. Like it wasn't going to be a pack. It wasn't going to be you know, anything that was going to go together, it was just going to be set up so that it was something they could download maybe every other day just to play with, see what they could do. More of like a challenge than, you know, buying a tool set. Um, 
And hopefully, you know, in exchange for that, like they want to support me in my work. And um, hopefully that would hold me over until potentially the platforms protected my tools better. Um, so what I'm really just like holding out for is some sort of platform that you can license tools from. You can go in mm -hmm. and you can say, I want this one in particular that I understand what I can use it for. I'm going to pull it directly into Photoshop. Like, you know, um, something that'll protect me in those cases, you know, um, but I also didn't want anyone else to sort of pick up this idea and, you know, be more comfortable with that than I was and start selling them and, you know, um, kind of go under my feet, I guess. So I started sharing, I opened up the, the Patreon and we're on month almost, what is it? I launched in May, June, July, August, September. So five months oh. now. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, wow. Yeah. And we, I'm, I, I'm so far ahead of the goals that I thought I'd be at. <laughs> um, I set a goal that I would start supporting iPad stuff. Um, if I got to a certain amount per month, because basically that amount would sustain me if I didn't have any work that month, like it would pay all my living expenses. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't expect to be there until like a year, maybe after I launched, I was thinking like January of next year at the earliest, potentially, uh, I'm there. That's <laughs> Congratulations. awesome. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. Uh, so now I, I recognize that there's definitely a base for this product. Um, I'm just building up this whole library. Like I can, I can choose to sell these, whatever, if I want to, it's not like I can't do that because I have a Patreon. Um, mm -hmm. but it's just kind of tidying me over until these platforms hopefully arise. Um, and I'm able to support myself through these tools basically. So yeah, it's great. It's basically just meant to encourage people to use digital tools more efficiently, I guess. I don't know. I don't know if efficient mm -hmm. is, is it's, it's like, it's the concept of working smarter, not harder, basically. Um, yeah, the, yeah. the product, yeah, the programs don't do the work for me. I'm not, uh, you know, like pressing some magic button, but <laughs> and it's there. <laughs> thinking about, you know, how I can reduce stress on my, on my physical, you know, I have tendonitis in my arm from drawing, like how I can cut down on that stress, how I can, you know, boost my productivity, how I can get repetitive, you know, time consuming parts of rendering done quicker. Um, and I'm, I'm, working on like basically encouraging other people to do the same way because it, it's weird. People don't think about Photoshop that way. I didn't think about Photoshop that way until I like accidentally stumbled upon it. Um, it's literally the Photoshop brush engine is it's a, a tool that makes tools. You, you can make it do whatever you want. Um, so encouraging that and uh, showing people what I can do with it. It's working so far. Like people are, are starting to do that and they're making their own brushes and they're sharing work with me. And like, it's fantastic. Um, so it's just, it's, it's creating a rhetoric, like to get back to the original question of like how I just became comfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's just, it's creating, you know, conversations. Um, it's what I do in my stream, uh, is I, I really consider what kind of environment I want to have. Um, I want people to come in and feel like they're sitting at a table working with me basically. Um, it's not about me in the work. It's about everyone that's there. I want everyone to just be very comfortable, like a shared workspace, basically. Um, I just happen to be the only one that they can, they can, you know, see. Um, I want my patrons to feel like that. I want them to feel like they can talk to me, that they can show me stuff that they're working on, like get feedback. Um, I just want that to be like a very good, productive relationship because, you know, it's as good for me as it is for them, I guess, at that point, because I'm seeing what other people are doing, like, we're talking things out, we're learning from each other. Um, and at that point, like, that's, that's more valuable to me, in terms of, like, online uh, relationships than just posting stuff to attract clients, or, mm -hmm. you know, gaining followers in hopes that some of them will buy prints, you know, um, it makes it more worthwhile for me. So getting over small roadblocks, I guess, where it's like, I'm not comfortable with people seeing what I'm doing or seeing the mm -hmm. mistakes that I'm making, uh, potentially judging me for that, you know, getting over that little stuff, 
so that you can get to actual meaningful discussion with people who are interested in your work and who are doing good work themselves um, is totally, totally worth it for me. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, wow, for sure. Wow, that was beautiful. That was amazing. Yeah. I just wanted to say, like, how amazing, like, uh, it was so brave of you to take that first step into, like, this whole new world and, like, how it brought you mm-hmm. to this place where you are now where it's, you seem... And I'm completely changed yeah. for it, too. Uh, like I said, I can't remember, like, how I got from point A to B. I think it's just because I'm so... Now I'm sitting here thinking about it. I think it's just because I'm so different now than I was. I literally can't remember what it was like being like that again. I just remember like physically being uncomfortable with people seeing stuff. I can't actually remember the mindset um, just because I completely like shed that skin, I guess. And it's something that I recommend everyone learn how to do just because it's been so liberating um, for me as a creator and a person. Like it's, it's one of the best things I can recommend figuring out how to do, I guess. Yeah, may, and also may I just say, well, first of all, big middle finger to whoever told you that yes, your work would never amount to anything. Like, Thanks. what the heck? But <laughs> I think it's so wonderful that you've come from that place of, you know, like discomfort and insecurity to building this wonderful community around your Not artwork. Out of spite. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe out of spite, yeah. Uh-huh. But now you've, you've made something so wonderful out of it and you have people Why to share your work with. Like, Exactly. exactly exactly and <laughs> I, I I personally feel like I have a lot to learn from you and I just you know appreciate you sharing your your story and your journey up, up till this uh, point yeah I feel like it's really inspiring to anyone out there who uh, may be in the same situation you were in like way back when and like yeah there are yeah. there's no one journey for an artist like exactly. there are bumps along the way and eventually you find out what you are and It'll, it might be something totally different from what you pictured like you would be when you first started, but exactly. it's different for everyone. Exactly. And I'm nowhere near where I thought I would be maybe seven years ago uh-huh. now. We'll say, God, it's been that long. <laughs> um, but I would not give any of it back. Like a lot of people, you know, when I talk about failing out or like my experiences with that, they're like, well, do you recommend art school? And it's, it's a complicated question. I wouldn't give my personal experiences back Um, just because I am who I am and I've done the things that I've done because of them. Um, and I'm completely like, I'm grateful for them. I'm completely situated in them. Like I'm fine with them. Um, so a lot of it's just being mindful and I think reflective of where you've come from, where the things that you've experienced are going to lead you to how to basically make everything work for yourself and then take that and, you know, make a space for others. Like you said, it's, it's the people who are in the same positions, who are unsure of themselves, who don't necessarily, you know, think that they're going to make it in this, this industry or whatever. It's showing and communicating and being open with them about those experiences, um, in order to encourage them, I guess, because that's what people did for me. And it's, it's the chain of, of, what it is that's how it works I guess absolutely yeah well I feel like Anusha I've mainly been asking the questions so is there now a question that you would like to present to Sid Um, me oh I thought okay never mind (laughs) (laughs) if I wanted to ask a question I was like I didn't know I had to prepare anything (laughs) um oh I did want to ask about your Adobe residency um what that whole experience was like what brought you to that and what you have learned from it because I thought that was really cool what you did um so yeah it was it was it was an amazing year that's for sure um I did not in any way anticipate what was going to happen during that year um a lot of stuff happened that I didn't plan for um I didn't do a lot of stuff that I did plan for um I, for one, I'm just incredibly grateful to Adobe. Honestly, that sounds really corny. I swear to God, I'm not being paid to say that. Um, (laughs) This is not an advertisement in any way. Like they just, they don't have to have a a program like that. They don't have to provide residencies. They don't have to have that entire team um, and budget that they just dump into creatives that they see something in, Um, but they do. And I think that that's incredible. Um, And my experience with it was nothing but positive. I would absolutely not 
be where I am today without it. And, you know, it just ended how many months ago? Um, I'm still working with them. I, I am getting ready to present workshops here at Adobe Max, which is like their big uh, yearly convention thing. Oh, that's um, awesome. So I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm giving actually brush making workshops for like, God, like three or 400 people. Wow. Las oh Vegas goodness. next month. Yeah, I've been stressing about that. That's been fun. Um, <laughs> oh, <you'll> be great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I've been working with them in some other capacities as well. Like it's just, it's a fantastic relationship. Everyone that I've met there that works there is just completely um, into like providing things for creatives and like making our lives easier and it's it's fantastic um so yeah i was with them for a year it, the residency provided full salary benefits travel hardware um and just unbelievable opportunities to travel and meet people and see things and do things and it was just it was wild um so my work i i got this straight out of college and you know you guys now know about my college experiences um so I pretty much just like did a 360 uh, where, you know, I was told what I was told, bailed out, didn't even know if I was going to like get a job to basically having this like major tech company sponsoring and like believing in me. So that was one like horrible ego inflation two crippling imposter syndrome <laughs> at the same time, somehow like a constant companion. Um, so I worked through that all year, and I think that that really honestly held me back a lot because um, I had I had not, you know, gone off on my own at that point. I was financially independent for the first time. Um, I was out of school, so I was like, oh, I'm a real adult now. Cool. I have bills to pay and stuff. Um, so I was, like, doing all of that at the same time. Um, so my original project that I pitched to them was an expansion of my thesis, and I, I sort of, I guess lost sight of the goals of that project, I'd say, um, for a lot of reasons. There was just a lot of other stuff going on. I was doing other things, like I was being encouraged to explore and, you know, experiment. Um, so somewhere along the way, yeah, it just shifted focus, I guess. And that was, that was encouraged. Like they encouraged it. Absolutely. They were excited about the stuff that I was doing. Once I figured out how to make these brushes, they were like, whoa, this is so cool. Um, so I, I held a lot of guilt about that, I guess. And I still, like, I, I finished the project for the most part. It just hasn't been released. Like, I'm literally just sitting on five full animated illustrations oh, wow. um, because I was getting ready to launch them, like, the week literally Trash Doves took off. Um, so I was being bombarded by people who really liked my drawings of birds on donuts. Uh <laughs> The project itself was like a deep and meaningful exploration of like the history of my area and like buildings. <laughs> so it's like, okay, I don't really have the audience for this right now. Um, but it, it, it was always sort of on the back burner, I guess, for everything else that I was doing during the year. And I think what I learned most from that experience of just like wrestling with these things was that um, it's, let me figure out how to phrase this hold on it's better to try to do or no okay here it's enough. <laughs> you got it, got it. <laughs> it's gonna be really meaningful when it comes out um it's enough to want to do good work it's enough mm -hmm. to want to make good work um you don't have to make important work you don't have to want to make important work if you're focusing mm -hmm. on making good work because the importance will come later. Um, that was something that I didn't necessarily recognize. That wasn't like a, a variation or a, you know, nuanced bit of information. I hadn't realized that in my, um, you know, inflated ego, uh, I have to do something really important and meaningful phase after all of this, you know? Um, and I realized that towards the end of the year. And now I think that's kind of something that I, I carry with me every day. That's something that I um, consider in everything that I make and do. And it's it's a good mindset, I think. It's much healthier um, for you as a creator just to focus on doing good work and pushing yourself to your own personal limits and experimenting and doing what feels right 
and then putting it out there and allowing importance to be assigned to it or, you know, other people to see it and say, oh, this is cool. Like, I want to work with you. Um, there's a difference there. And I think it's very important to figure that out and then uh, live by it in whatever way that you can. Does that make sense? Certainly. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 That was I think actually it's a really good mindset to have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I, I think it's a good mindset to have whenever you're creating work because, of course, a, a small amount of pressure is always necessary in it order to. It that pressure, yeah. It right, right. But you don't need to like overcompensate. That pressure, exactly. and, like, that pressure yeah. doesn't lead to anything good in my experience. It just takes up space in your head that could otherwise be used to you know, explore and make something really unique and new for yourself and surprise yourself. Like when your head's clouded by all that stuff and you're worried about all those things, it's, it's, you're not going to make it work. Like it's just, you're, you're not. So it's important to kind of shed that and get rid of it and just, just get out of there. Oh my gosh, Sid, I feel like if you ever do choose to go down that route, I think that you would make a wonderful teacher because <laughs> you, you have you're this level of compassion. There. Yeah, you have this compassion and like this this understanding. Yeah, yeah. When yeah. I say I'm gonna teach, I don't know in what capacity, um, just because of my uh, complicated feelings about art school. <laughs> um, <laughs> I teach on my streams. You know, I I've been doing workshops recently of doing some public speaking. Yeah, I think eventually down the road I will definitely be in some yeah, sort of I think teaching you'd be capacity. At it. and it's in my blood. Like my mom and my grandma were both like school teachers, so. Yeah, I think it's it's inevitable that I'll end up some doing something like that, you know. I don't know when, but yeah, but thank you for saying that. Yeah, yeah, it'll happen if and when it happens, of course. Yeah, exactly. Of course. exactly. <laughs> oh, I do have a question about the Adobe residency. So <laughs> would you... Yeah, sorry, did I actually answer any of your original questions? <laughs> I think you did, for the um, most part. Yeah, 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 definitely. Okay, definitely. go ahead. So would you recommend any artist to try out or to go for the Adobe yes, residency? Yes, absolutely. Um, when I, like, I, I applied for it uh, a couple of months before I graduated college. Um, during that time, I was pretty much applying to, like, anything I could find that said that, like, it needed Photoshop experience. Mm -hmm. um, I think within, like, the span of December and January 2014, 16, um, I sent out probably close to a hundred cover letters. Wow. Adobe was the only wow. thing I did back then. Literally what? only thing. Um, and it was just something that I saw and I was like, oh my God, this is like a dream job. Like <laughs> there's no way. However, I knew like if I didn't apply for it, you know, it's that feeling where it's like, you never know. And it's like, if you don't try, then you never will yeah, know. There's really no harm in like, um, applying. Cause you never know. Yeah. And it, like the, like it, it, for the most part, the application, it might be different next year. I don't know. Um, the application has, has historically required a proposal for your project that you, you know, want to work on. Um, if anything, you know, if you don't get a call back, if you don't, you know, get anything out of it other than, you know, just putting together that proposal, you have outlined an entire project for yourself, basically. Like you've outlined goals, you've outlined a production schedule, um, like that's meaningful. That's a really good skill. That's if you've never done that before, that's a great thing to figure out how to do. Um, if you want to follow through with that project, fantastic. Like you've just, you figured it all out for yourself. Um, that's not nothing like, you know, that's really valuable. Um, if you don't want to continue with it, you know, if you, if you don't get a call back or whatever, um, you, you now know how to lay out a whole project. Like I said, like, that's a really, really good skill to have. And for that reason alone, I recommend it. Like it's, it's really good to figure out how to organize yourself and present your ideas, um, how to pitch, you know, it's a, it's a real world experience of, of doing that and putting yourself out there and your ideas out there to be judged effectively. Um, and then, you know, it, it toughens your skin. Rejections suck. Like it's, <laughs> it's never fun to, you know, not even get a, not even to get a rejection just to hear nothing back. Like that's terrible. But every time you do that, like your skin thickens a little bit, you become a little bit more confident, I think, at least I do. Um, and that it's like, okay, well, it just, it wasn't a good fit. It wasn't, you know, meant to be. Um, that doesn't mean that my work isn't good. Like that's never right. what it means. Um, it just means that you got to keep developing it. You got to keep going. You got to just keep looking for the right fit 
for what it is that you want to do, basically. So yeah, the application is just, it's another, another good exercise in that and all of that stuff. And best case scenario, you get what I, what I got, you get an email that's like, Hey, I want to talk to you about my ideas. Like we want to potentially like invite you to be a creative resident. Um, and you get to talk to really cool people about your work and like your thoughts and your ideas. Um, my interview process after the phone interview, I, they flew me to San Francisco and I, spent a whole day talking to professionals, like actual developers, like working on the products that I used every single day. Um, like they wanted to know what I, I used them for and like what I, what, how I learned them, like all this stuff. And that's just like an amazing experience in itself. And then ultimately, yeah, I was offered the residency. Um, so then I just had a fantastic year and I made lifelong connections and friendships. Um, and like there's really nothing bad that you can get out of applying or, you know, at least trying to do it. So yeah, I absolutely recommend it to anybody. There you go. It's a meaningful <laughs> experience. Either way, you learn something new. 100%. All right. I have a question for you. Um, okay. So we have, we briefly talked about this over Twitter a couple of days back, um, huh? but um, it's always an issue for artists who like try to balance um, personal life and work life and like trying to find a hobby between, between all of that yeah. because at some point like as much as you love art like I was a professional artist you can't that kind of like stops being a hobby for you and like it stops mm, being yes. like relaxing for you so I wanted to ask like what is your downtime activity um it's did you mention gardening before <laughs> yeah yeah so I started doing some some plant care recently um okay let's rewind a little okay. bit so <laughs> take it all the way right. back <laughs> Yeah, why not? Let's let's get super candid. Um, so I mentioned I moved a couple months ago. Um, I actually like I was I was in Florida for college uh, and the and the residency for like six years total. Um, after the residency was ending, I I turned down a couple opportunities to move west coast. Um, basically because uh, my mom hasn't been doing well for probably about seven years now. Uh, she's been declining. She had a neurological condition. Um, over the summer, she was actually re-diagnosed with ALS, which is a really piece of work disease if you don't know what it is. Um, so basically I was in a position with my career that I, I could work from wherever, right? So I work remotely. Um, so I moved home and now I live about 30 minutes from where I grew up. Um, my, a lot of people online don't know this, but, um, what I do pretty much week to week and what I've been doing for a couple months now um, has been uh, basically part to full-time caregiving for my mother, who's almost fully disabled. Um, so that takes a lot of a lot of time out of the day. It's 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 a stressful experience. Um, it's a lot to wrangle mentally. Um, you know, just watching this decline. Um, so I was kind of balancing working and you know doing this stuff and. Uh, after after trash toast, of course, all of that happened. I just wasn't feeling super great about my work, and um, right. yeah. So like, I I was just sort of doing my work. My productivity, my like my my productivity fell out. You know, fell right in the trash. Like I wasn't making anything. Um, I was trying to make work for clients, and it just like wasn't the best. Like I fell back on a couple like deadlines. A couple projects were canceled because of this. Um, so it was just like, I was in a really, really, really bad place with it. Um, so basically I kind of decided, I was like, I need something for me that's not tied to the stressful thing in my life or my main source of income. Mm -hmm. Um, so when I got back in my apart in my new apartment, which I I've been here for two months now, um, I fell back on plant care, which is something that I liked a lot when I was in Florida. Um, so I got some house plants and I started just, I leaned fully into it. Like I started watching a bunch of plant care videos and like how to fertilize, you know, what kind of soil moisture, or whatever, just like all the little stuff. Like I fully <laughs> got into it and learned a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and then, yeah, like a couple weeks ago, I decided to gut this like succulent bowl that we had over the summer. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to start propagating succulents now. Um, <laughs> So I started a succulent farm and I have a couple of cookie sheets of like succulent leaves that 
yeah, if you don't know, like you pull a succulent leaf off, it will grow a new succulent off of the base. It'll put out roots and then it'll grow a whole new plant. Um, yeah. So I have probably like 200 plants currently growing. <laughs> um, oh, it sounds like heaven. So <laughs> yeah, it's great. And I have like my new apartment has huge windows. Um, and we have like uh, east, south, and west facing light. So it's like perfect for plant growing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I set up a whole like plant room and uh, it's, it's just, it's really, really good for my mental health. Like it's done so much for me just to have something to like, look forward to taking care of the next day or like checking in on the next day and like plotting progress. And, you know, like I talk to my plants, I sing to my plants. It's, it's Aww. so Aww. sweet it's that way. You know, it's, it's, it's good to center yourself. Um, yeah, at this point, yeah, we had this discussion where a lot of other people have you know, hobbies or things that they like outside of art, which is, yeah, for most of us, our primary source of income now, um, it's, it's very good to have that because it's, it's like recharging your batteries. I think I already feel the positive, uh, you know, effects of it. It's something to get you out of your space, you know, of clients or patrons or, you know, whatever it is that takes up all of your, your attention. Um, oftentimes sapping your creative energies, you know, so that you're not making stuff for yourself anymore. You're making stuff for them. Um, and doing that thing for yourself, it recharges that even though it's not creating, it just gets you out of that stressful mindset and it completely just rejuvenates that it it refills those tanks Mm -hmm. and even just 20 minutes a day, you know, whatever it is, like if, you can find like you can find 20 minutes uh you know just don't watch another episode of netflix or whatever (laughs) Um, (laughs) you know like i feel like it's 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 something that you absolutely can do and you just have to pick something it doesn't even have to be something that you're like really 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 passionate about it's just something that you have mild interest in um lean into it learn as much as you can about it um find people in your community that are interested in it like i've made a couple friends recently uh, with people who also propagate locally, just like on my block. Um, <laughs> the, there's a little like apothecary down the road from me and they sell succulents. And I walked in and they're like, I started talking to them about that. And now like I'm taking care of some of their succulents and like they've given me some of their dying plants to like add to my farm. And they're like, hey, if you know, your your babies grow up to be big and strong, like we can sell them here. Like just find people to connect over those things. Find people outside of your your main source of stress and what it is you do all the time. Um, and give that to yourself, like give yourself that gift basically. Like I was talking about in, in, in the tweet thread, Anusha, um, my dad does this a lot. Uh, my dad kind of goes through like phases with his hobbies. Um, and it's almost like an annual or biannual cycle. So <laughs> he's like the past 10 years or whatever, he's been into like, fish tank care and he like completely leaned into it and there was so like our house was just tropical fish tanks and like he had reef tanks and like he set up this whole like filtering system and like we'd go to meetups in like Pittsburgh and we'd like trade off fish and like cuttings from his plants and made a bunch of friends that way um he was really into car care and he would like take his like souped up you know sports car to like car shows um and like he joined internet forums about it um right now it's droning he's really into like flying drones. Um, so like over the summer he got like this fancy little drone and he got all of his like, uh, certifications and licensing so he can fly commercially. So people are now like hiring him to go out on the weekends and do like flyovers of like local buildings that are like either going to be for sale or going to be torn down, um, for documentation. And he just really likes it. And then when he gets bored, he moves on to the next thing, um, whatever interests him. And it, it's really healthy to see that, honestly. It's really good to see um, that fluctuation of passion uh, and that eagerness to learn, I guess. Um, whatever it is, you know, you stick with it, you learn as much as you can. If you get bored, you move on to the next thing. Um, it's it's just something that you should, I think everyone should absolutely do for themselves, uh, no matter what industry you're in, no matter what you do for a living. Um, I think ours is a little bit unique just because, you know, most of what we do comes out of a a passion or a hobby that we started when we were kids, most likely. Um, 
you know, you don't start out being a dentist as a kid, like, (laughs) um, but just, I think for everybody, I think that's a, that's a really, really good thing. And yeah, did that answer the question? For sure. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, definitely. I think that it's, it's great, you know, and a big part of life is just learning new things and finding enjoyment and in all the things that you want to know more about. And it's funny because Anusha and I were actually having this discussion, you know, I had asked her like, is art something that you want to do for the rest of your life as like your main career? Mm -hmm. And she was telling me like, you know, I have dreams about moving to, you know, like a small town in Europe and becoming like a pumpkin farmer or Uh something like that. (laughs) It's just like, Right now, we think that art is the only thing that we're ever going to be. But Mm -hmm. in reality, our lives are made of so much more. And we can become and choose to become anything that we want to at any given time. Yeah, exactly. And that's fantastic. It's terrifying and fantastic at the same time. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So you should always have more than one thing, I think. just for a variety, you know, variety is oh, yeah. twice a life. It's totally true. Uh, Vicky, do you have any other questions? Um, I don't have any other questions. I, I did want to just add on a little thing to this whole hobby conversation, sure. which is that what I've been doing for myself is taking up baking. And yeah. I made a loaf of banana bread yeah. last week, and it was so much fun. And yesterday I went to the grocery market to buy ingredients for pumpkin spice cupcakes and cream cheese oh, frosting that I'm going to be making this week. Right? And I, I was, like, so excited, like, walking down those aisles. I'm like, yes, I'm going <laughs> to make these. It's going to be so much fun. So it's definitely. So yeah. <laughs> That's great. Good for you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. But, yeah, um, I don't think I have any more questions. I guess yeah. I have one last question before we start to okay. wrap this up because, like, we are at an hour and six minutes through. So um, last question <laughs> is, uh, what made you decide to be an artist? Oh, my God. <laughs> the ultimate question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I was thinking about this. This is kind of funny. I was thinking about this um, just because – uh, someone else that I know is, is starting a podcast as well, uh, specifically interviewing female illustrators. I think more on the design and lettering side of things. But um, I'm like all these podcasts are popping up, and I'm going to listen to all of them. It's so awesome. <laughs> I'm like, eventually, I'm going to want to do my own podcast just because oh, that, be like, that's what I do. I get really into it. Um, <laughs> like, oh my god, what would my podcast be? Um, so my original drive for like what I I had, a, I had a really, like, very privileged childhood. Like, my parents are amazing. Um, they sent me to art classes. Like, I had private drawing classes when I was in primary school. Like, I was in all that stuff. Um, and, like, you know, when you're seven, you don't really appreciate that for what it is. Uh, I would begrudgingly go to those classes and stuff. So, like, it's, it's false to say that I didn't have anything like that before this thing that I'm going to say. But this thing that I, I was really inspired by... Um, is fully what I like point to. Um, I got involved with Neopet and yes, started Neopets. drawing. My we, we've all been there. <laughs> yes, and making stories. And I, it was my first, like looking back, it was my first community that I was a part of. Like I never had many friends at school. None of them really were interested in things that I was interested in. Like I was like a nerd. I like to read and like play video games and stuff. Um, so I found this community in like making art for my characters there with other, you know, kids that were making art for their characters and writing. And I learned a code, like very basic coding for my pet pages. Um, but in all of this, you know, I was, di- I was drawing my dumb little dragons. Like I was teaching myself design software. I begged my parents for like Photoshop and a tablet. I didn't even know what those things were. It was just what other people were saying that they had. And I'm like, dad, I need this. <laughs> um, and I ended up with like Photoshop, which I'm sure was pirated and a tablet. And I just kept going with it all the way through high school. And so I started having like, you know, more serious art classes. I started going to like art camps in the summer. Um, and I, I, I saw, I met other professionals, like, well, I wasn't a professional at that point. I met professionals, um, who were making a living from their art. And I started thinking about it and I was like, wait, people make art for a living for Neopets. Like I should go and do that. Um, 
so it was really just that I just I really just fell in love with creating and like connecting with other people about what I was creating um and being a part of that whole ecosystem and that community and I love talking about it like can you hear me smiling right now um (laughs) I I can't hear the smile in your voice it's incredible I I was like when I was thinking about what my podcast would be I was like I need to start interviewing other artists who got their start on Neopets (laughs) yes um, that should just be my podcast. Yeah, because it's like listening to your story right now, I was just like immediately yeah. like, wait, this is me. This is my life. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. It's like everyone our age. And um, like, it, it would just be a bunch of professionals because we've all like made it to that point now talking about our favorite things about Neopets and just like reminiscing. Be Don't be surprised if I actually end up doing please. this. Like, this is my idea. <laughs> yes, please do it, actually. <laughs> what Neopets did you And you have? know what? Sorry, um, I was head, a fan. I want to know. <laughs> I was I was a fan of the Drakes. Um, I could never afford Drakes when I was a kid because Neopets was like horrible. Um, <laughs> I had Choirus. I had a Bori. I had Aisha. Oh, cute. Um, Were they painted? I now at this point. Okay, full one hundred percent honesty. I still play Neopets like every day. <laughs> um, if only just to go on and like get my bank interest, basically. I made three hundred thousand neo points on the on the Whoa, stock market last okay. night, guys. Oh dang. <laughs> myself on the back there, but um uh, it's just it's not the same, of course. Uh-huh. It's completely different now. But it was it was my everything I loved as a kid and um yeah. <laughs> I wanna ask, did you um, did you ever, like, apply for, like, the, um, or, like, su- submit, I mean, to, like, the art contest and, like, random contests? Oh, of stuff? course. Of did course. You ever win? Beauty contest, art gallery. Yes. You did? I oh. a lot of trophies. Um, I was in the Neopian Times a couple times no with way. comments. Uh, oh, you're a pro. Yes. <laughs> I had so much fun uh, with all of that. And, yeah, pretty much every week for, like, a couple years I was in the, the beauty contest with my, my pets. And um, it was... It was definitely my main reason for living <laughs> for a couple weeks. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it was fun. Um, Long live Neopets. <laughs> I feel Neopets. so sad about Neopets because I went on pretty recently and like it has I mean, the death is in sight. So... No, the death is in sight. I mean, Adobe just announced that they're cutting support for Flash in oh, like no. countdown 1.5 years now. You know, not that stuff isn't gonna get converted to anything. Like all of those games just aren't gonna work anymore. Yeah. Like you already can't play in Chrome. You have to go to like Firefox and uh-huh. some other browser that supports Flash. Like mm. you can't go to the maps. And I'm just like, oh, what am I gonna do? I kind of wish that like a bunch of us artists could get together, buy Neopets, and like revive it. <laughs> right? Like, uh like my dream goal if I ever win the lottery I'm buying Neopets back and like <laughs> we're gonna fix this <laughs> fix Neopets 2k20 yeah yeah that's Just... the goal that's the goal right now <laughs> <laughs> okay all right I think that's it um Sid, yeah. thank you so much for joining us yeah um, thank you guys. I'm so really excited great. to see what you guys do with this podcast like I don't even I don't even know your goals are for it or anything but i think it's gonna be great i'm really excited that you're doing it thank you so much we really enjoyed having you um yeah. you know, talk with us today and, and just learning more about you as a person you know because that really feeds into everything that you do <laughs> yeah totally uh so where can our listeners find you i am at sid weiler everywhere that's s-y-d-w-e-i-l-e-r um except neopet <laughs> that's a secret <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm there everywhere. Twitter, Instagram, Twitch, Behance, Facebook, uh, you can go and find the Trash Doves and that'll link you back to me somehow. <laughs> and is there anything uh, you want to plug, like any upcoming projects? Oh, heck, go look at my Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> it's paying my bills, please, go look at it. <laughs> yes, please. Um, that's probably it. Everything else is NDA. <laughs> <laughs> so much said for coming thank on thank you guys that was such a pleasure Thank you for listening to The Art Corner. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at The Art Corner Pod or send us any questions or comments at The Art Corner Podcast at gmail.com. You can also find all of our episodes on workbook.com slash art corner.
Our theme music was made by the amazing Louis Zong, and you can follow him at Everyday Louis. You can also follow Anusha on Twitter at Foxville underscore art and follow Vicky at Vicky Sai. Please review and subscribe to our podcast. We'd greatly appreciate it. Thanks again and see you next time.